sound out there. Please take your seats. We're almost ready to go. I did it. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Abhishek Mathur, and uh, welcome to Houston Oasis. I'm one of the board members uh, for the organization. And uh, uh, Houston Oasis is uh, Houston's very own secular community. Uh, lights, I guess. <laughs> um, well, we have uh, a few core values here uh, that you see behind me. Uh, some of the ones I like uh, are uh, reality is no known through reason and meaning comes from making a difference. Um, we'll talk about uh, some of those, how, how we put those into action uh, as uh, the gathering goes along. Um, at first, uh, we, uh, we're going to have a couple songs uh, by Brightwire here. Uh, they're one of our favorite groups, and uh, you've uh, probably, if uh, you've uh, been coming here for a while, you've uh, heard them play uh, both here and uh, also our sister community uh, in uh, Galveston Bay. Uh, so take it away, right wire.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Ready? All right. Yeah. Now there's one more of the benefits of getting up early in the morning. We get to listen to Brightwire. Um, all right, uh, let's get to our uh, main talk now. Um, our, our main talk today is uh, by Samantha Hernandez, uh, who's a digital creator, a self-love advocate, former social enterprise founder, well, quite a lot of things here. <laughs> all right. Um, so I'll, get, I'll let her get to it, and um, uh, one of our uh, uh, speaker team members, uh, Perla Moreno, will also introduce uh, some of the uh, uh, more, uh, uh, a diff uh, slightly different version of the talk, so we'll get to that eventually. All right, thank you. Sorry. Okay, can you all hear me okay? Good morning. Um, I must admit, this is my first time at Oasis, and I have to keep telling myself that I'm not at Bible study. Uh, I was in the church for a very long time, which I was, I, I was smart then too. I was at Saturday night church because I still didn't like to wake up early, but 
Um, yeah, a part of me was like, oh no, like uh, like a centimeter of my midriff sh could show, and I have my "Don't Panic, It's Organic" sticker. But I'm I'm so happy to be here, and the reason I titled my talk "The Urgency of Self Love" is because I find myself finding urgency associated with so many things, uh, so many production-based things, so many financial-based things, um, that I think it is urgent that we evaluate the way that we look at ourselves, the way that we evaluate ourselves, what we compare our success to, what we compare our joy to. And um, in that, I'm sure ev if you're here, we know about mindfulness, we know about self-care, we know about all of these things. But I just wanna share a little bit from, from my perspective, um, kind of how my self-love journey came to be because it was really aggressive and I spent a long time with a very, um, specific population I feel like taught me a lot. But before we do that, I would love a microphone and a volunteer. Okay, yes. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for saying that so fast. What's your name? Marilyn. Marilyn, okay. Marilyn, would you just say three things, and would you stand out here so the light's yeah, not? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you just say three things that you truly love about yourself? And if possible, I don't want to hear like you're really nice to other people. Like just things about you that you love. <laughs> um, I have an incredibly quick mind. I am generous and empathetic. And I'm always striving to learn new things and improve. Thank you so much. Woo! Thank you. And you did that pretty fast. Was it hard at all? No. No, good. I love to hear it. Anyone else? So let me get one more person. One more person. Share three things they like about themselves. Now that you know what it is, there's like silence. Come on, this is very uncool, but I would really love one more person. Yes, thank you. Which, don't, don't do it for me, I, I will sit in silence. Okay, I like that I have ADHD, and that was really hard coming to that. Um, I like that uh, I think outside of the box, and I like that, I like my eyes. <laughs> okay, thank you for doing that. Um, the reason I want you, I, I kind of want to start there, is because we find it, uh, I mean, I find it, that in this world it's like not very cool to talk about yourself. It's not very cool to like yourself or to brag about yourself. Um, but I find that a lot of really toxic behaviors are cool. Like, it's okay. Like, don't brag about yourself but you know, and exploit an entire workforce to make your company run. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Like, don't you take too many days off. That's really, really unprofessional. Like, but please, like, treat people like absolute garbage and build a company that only runs on people being absolutely miserable. You, there's things that feel backwards. And so my story, a little bit about my story, and it matters because it's why I think the way that I do was I spent many years working with people who had been trafficked. And um, doing that, I learned way more about what I didn't know <laughs> and way more about myself than I ever learned about traffic. Well, I do, I learned a lot about trafficking, but it unveiled so much about myself. Um, and I spent about years, some of the people in the room know, working um, to develop specifically a lot of different programs to reach people who'd been trafficked, to help with recovery. I'm not a therapist, but just to walk alongside the structural part of like rebuilding a career getting a license. And so I developed this thing called a social enterprise that I was so proud of. And I eventually left my nonprofit career in anti-human trafficking because I was with a religious group. And within that religious group, um, there was not always space. I mean, I'm not a religious person. I stopped being a Christian and it was my dream career, but I realized that I couldn't exist in dogmatic spaces and I couldn't allow and promote like people you know, fragile people to go into dogmatic spaces. I, I just couldn't do it anymore. But I, I built this store and it was the, my favorite part about my job was I got to work with people at this little candle shop. And I realized that these were supposed to be un, unworkable people, <laughs> people who had trauma that was, oh, this condition and that condition and they're antisocial and this and whatever, d you know, diagnosis, their stories are theirs. I don't want to give away any information, but not supposed to be working. And you know what, you know what? They were the greatest employees. Why were they great employees? Because I was trained in like basic trauma care. And so all that research, all those conferences I went to, I learned like, let people have breaks when they want them. Uh, 
I was like, whoa, I'm going to change the world, pay people a living wage. Oh, my God. Wow. Listen to them when they complain. Listen to what they want in the way that their work is. So, like, if, if um, someone would be like, oh, you know, when we make candles, there's wax everywhere. And we use too many paper towels to, like, clean up every day, and I require the space to be cleaned every day. So we started using butcher paper. We realized we use less paper by putting down butcher paper. But there was, you know, little mentalities of like, hey, don't just dominate people, collaborate with them. <laughs> and then I just went, I have never experienced that kind of treatment in my life. <laughs> and I'm not experiencing it in this job from my people. I'm not experiencing it anywhere. And, I, and, and it was at this point where I, was, I had done all this great stuff and I walked away from this career because I realized I loved myself for the first time and that what I had created for this group, like I needed to create for myself. I realized constant disregard of my physical and emotional needs was never making me a better person. I spent years working, like before I had a kid, because you know, very much humility on, uh, I would work 60 hour weeks, I lived on a shelter an hour outside of town, drive in, do eight hours, sometimes do ministry and outreach in the afternoon, come home not exist and a lot of different things. Um, and I realized that living a life of a martyr, I was even on Viceland. You can go see me in a cult, like living sadly <laughs> on television. And, and I realized that I, I was waiting for someone to come like do it back to me. And it just wasn't coming. I was never filling my cup. And the thing that, in th that led me here, because it didn't just happen that one day I loved myself and I was like, hey, these systems are really toxic for me. Um, this, uh, one thing changed it all, a very simple book that uh, unraveled the thread, and it was a stupid book called Intuitive Eating, <laughs> and I, I want you to stay with me because uh, diets are like politics, okay, <laughs> and I am not challenging your personal paradigm of food, I'm only challenging your personal paradigm of the way you view others that aren't you or your, your body shape, things like this. We have a registered dietitian in the room who'd be happy to take questions, I'm just, just not me. <laughs> I read this book. And I read a scientifically backed, medically supported, nutritionist champion book that said that I wasn't a bad person for being in a large body. It said that weight cycling and constant, constant dieting, constant restrictive dieting and fasting was causing my body to hold weight. And, and I was reading more about BMI being fake. And I was reading all these things. And, and what happened was I realized that a system based on capitalistic gain convinced me to not listen to the body I've known my entire life. And that disconnect from my intrinsic communication with my own body, I did not realize was like ruining my life. I was walking around thinking, I don't deserve health care. I don't deserve love. I don't deserve pregnancy because the way I interpret, and if you're not living in a large body, and a lot more women I think will, so, but people can have eating disorders in any body. Like I, I was training for like, out in bullshit, like a 25 mile bike ride. And it was around COVID time and I, I started getting like sniffles and I was like, oh my God, I gotta go to the doctor. Go to the doctor and I am like, I gotta get COVID test because I'm, you know, I didn't tell him why. I don't, no one needs my business. Anyway, COVID test, he was like, hey, you're negative. But he came in, he was like, you know, I need to talk to you. The best way to stay away from sickness is to work on that immunity and get moving. And he was like, just start a little bit, a mile a day, just a little walking. And I was like, I do a weightlifting. <laughs> I could throw you. Like, you have no idea what my life is, but that treatment, and that doesn't, maybe that's not your story with your body, but maybe in religion, maybe in somewhere else, you have this system of believing you failed based on something that has nothing to do with you or your life. For me, that was diet culture BMI. So what that did was I said, uh-oh, I don't trust anything that makes me feel bad anymore <laughs> because I realized my body was not my enemy. I realized that when I stopped dieting, I was like, oh, I don't just eat cookies all day because my body craves good things. And I said, wait, if my body could be good, I'm not pure evil. There's good basic within me. And then religion was like <laughs> <laughs> right out the door because I said, I, and I also, I had a child and I looked at that baby in the crib and I said, I don't care what you do. You're not going to hell. You might go to jail one day and I will send you letters because <laughs> I love you, <clears throat> but I don't believe in hell. And then in that season, when I believed my body was good, I, let I started treating my body like it was good. 
people who hurt my body for the first time in my life were no longer allowed in my life. I didn't care if it made them feel bad. I didn't care if it made them feel uncomfortable. I didn't, make, I didn't care if I had to cut off friends that loved me. For the first time in my life, I cut off people based on my needs and not theirs. And maybe you do this all the time. Like, slay. Maybe you're born with confidence. There's a lot of men in the room. This might not. This may be more of an eye-opening way of how some other people think. I, I don't know where you're at. But for me to stand up for myself and say, hey, you sexually assaulted me. I, you're not allowed around me was a huge change for me. But what happened is I would look in the mirror and I would say, she's important. Because I, I thought to myself, wh what would I tolerate for my daughter? I wouldn't let a predator around my daughter. And then I thought, why don't I love myself that way? And then when I started to, I walked different. Because my body remembered the respect that I advocated for. And I felt that I kept, and, and then, it, again, more stuff started unraveling. And I learned about this definition, um, which mostly is connected to women in, in, in study or whatever, but like, I want you to think that this can apply to men, it can apply to people, multiple people, but human giver syndrome is a theory that I read in a book called Come As You Are, really great, uh, like human sexuality book, um, is a theory that women often experience burnout because they put their needs, desires, and feelings aside to support others, based that self-care is selfish, and that we should always be happy, beautiful, grateful, and giving. Um, and that's what I thought I needed to be in the midst of crisis, in the midst of this. And what I realized was that I had no capacity. I was in burnout constantly. Also, I was quite judgmental. I felt that at the height of my martyrdom, I hated everyone. I thought everyone was beneath me, that they, not beneath me, but like, wow, they, they just don't even know what it's like to live like, the, like me. And I was so narcissistic because I never took responsibility for my own pleasure. I, I remember my therapist at one point saying like, if you're not gonna meet any of your needs, you're going to do this, this, and this. And I was like, my needs aren't an important thing. She's like, no, 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 they are. And I was so shocked. And all of this unraveled to me. And I, I just realized that I had to live my life different. So I encourage people to think about your life and to think about compassion as being a capacity. Like if you're not taking care of your basic needs, which are not like some women think that self-care is like pedicures. That's like self-grooming. <laughs> we are not like some sort of show horse. Like if y'all get to do golf, I'm not going to have shards of my body scratched off. Like I want to do fun things. I want to throw axes or whatever. And I think this is all tied into what we're supposed to be as women, right? And what we're supposed to look like. And as men, you might have an industry that you're supposed to lead this one way, which is probably a really shitty way to lead. Oh, sorry. Um, you know what I mean? Because when there's no change, there's no ingenuity, there's no diversity. Oh, see, I'm on it. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> things get better. So we're, I, I also want to keep in mind that like there was a time where we were keeping up with like the neighbors, right? And now we're keeping up with the Kardashians in the entire world. You are overwhelmed with images of what success or beauty or goodness or a fulfilled life will be, and, and I just want to say that, like, only you can just decide what makes you happy. You know, I used to judge people who didn't, tr like, my parents, because they didn't travel, they just, my dad loves to just be on his couch and watching television and having sweet tea with his wife, and I would be like, oh my god, dad, you're so boring, and now I get it. Honestly, <laughs> my couch in my house, like, I get it, but I want to give you some tips to foster self-compassion, because I don't want to leave you just saying, hey, you should like yourself, because You've been taught how to hate yourself your whole life. I'm sorry, you have. Like things of every commercial is why your life should be better, why your car should be better, why you should be skinnier, why you should be faster. Um, oh, can you stretch like this? Can you do that? This is how you should change your life. This is the three businesses you should have. Oh, you still have a, this kind of savings and not an IRI. Or, there's a million things that could be wrong. But I want to show you some things of how to foster a relationship with yourself. The first thing is to honor your unique body and wellness choices. Look, intuitive eating is like for me, for the vegan, for whatever, if you need, if you're at a doctor's office and you're knowing that something's wrong, every time you say something for yourself, I believe your body remembers. And not everybody's ever going to understand your choices. So I, I have scripts. I literally have scripts at the doctors because I know my choices um, of recovery from my eating disorder are like very weird to some doctors. I tell them not to weigh me because it's very triggering to see the number. And if they need to weigh me, I ask them not to communicate the number to me. And in their mind, I know this nurse is thinking, this crazy 
fat lady. And I'm like, that's fine because you don't pay my bills and we're not in a relationship. That is okay because if I don't hear that number, I'm going to have a better day and you don't have to live with that. I do. And so I have scripts for myself to advocate for myself in these spaces. And I suggest you do the same. Like, you don't, I, I'm never rude to anybody, but I maintain that for my body. And what I find that it does is people see it and they go, I can maintain that for me. I can ask for what I need. And for my daughter, you know, I'm teaching her how to advocate for herself because I realize we're so used to being passive with our desires and our needs, right? Like, oh, this would be nice instead of going out. I think women struggle or femme presenting people might struggle more, but this one is be where you are. Mindfulness has really, really been helpful for me. There's a, if you've never like studied it, there's a great audible course called The Science of Mindfulness. Being where you are and not being in where you should be, not being in a body that you used to have, a body that you want to have, um, I think is gracious to yourself. Consider pleasure. I think consider pleasure is a need. If you're not having fun, if you're not doing things, if you're in your relationships, you're not meeting, whatever, you know, there's many facets of this that are both family pr uh, fr friendly and not. But I think it's important to say, what does that look like for me in a way that's both harmonious and doesn't cause harm and make sure that I'm taken care of? Um, because I don't think anyone, does anyone want to live a life without fun or pleasure? No, but like we acted like it when we were in the church, like act like I love being a martyr. I love working out every day and never having a carb and doing this. And it's like, no, we have to make space for it so that we don't manipulate other people to get it from them in a way that's not healthy. That's, that's just an idea. Some other ideas that I could give you to foster uh, self-compassion, which I put the other ones. Redefine success as peaceful. Yeah, ruin your reputations on here, because I think that's really, really fun. Um, <laughs> I ruined my reputation. So mind you, I used to be a worship leader, uh, like nonprofit, anti-trafficking, like kind of pinnacle in my, in my community. And now I like do weed marketing for cannabis companies. And um, let me tell you why I love that. Um, I would rather be good to me and have other people think I'm good than perform morality. Yes, slay. Um, <laughs> unfollow people that make you jealous. Do not co surround yourself with people that do not make you feel good in your own skin. Understand that you're not for everyone. And it's okay. Like, I have an open hand with relationships now that I'm so grateful for. It has no reflection of my value. It just says, you're not my puzzle piece, bro. You're not my puzzle piece. And honestly, that would exhaust me because we don't, we don't mesh. It's not, it's not re rejection. So, uh, yeah. Pleasure is probably important. These are just some ideas. And whatever you do, your journey is your own. The last thing I would just say is your autonomous journey. The stuff that isn't important, don't make important. You know what I mean? Don't harm. Have fun. And see if there's a way that we can exist together that doesn't make us everything feel so strivy and difficult. But I hope that this was helpful. And this is my information if you want to contact me. But um, if anything, I just hope that you'll be kind to yourself. And I think we're going to do some other things after this. Uh, oh, oh, the, I'm going to leave the thing. Okay, we're actually going to do a little activity. I want you to take this kind of conversation that we's, we've had. And I would love for you to find two or three people. They can be people that you know. They don't have to be new people or people you don't know. But please be aware that if you see someone doing this by themselves, like mercy grab them and pull them in. Um, you don't have to participate. Everybody can like ignore me if you want, but I think it'll be fun. And I would like for you to share some things that you enjoy about yourself to each other. And the reason I want to do this is I feel that it is socially uncouth to practice. Like, I don't know if you noticed the first slide had a picture of myself and I made y'all stare at that for a long time. Old me would have literally died. <laughs> I would have so died. <laughs> but I think practicing um, a type of welcomed self like celebration can create spaces where it says, I, I want everybody to feel that way about themselves. This isn't a competition space because your gifts are also a blessing to everybody around you. So thank you so much. And if y'all go ahead and stand and find some people, y'all can do that now. Sorry if this feels churchy and weird. <laughs> Greet one another. <laughs>
All right, everyone. Um, I believe uh, we're going to do a coffee break for now. And uh, you can, I guess, continue your conversation here. Uh, all good. Uh, we're going to do a coffee break. Uh, please look at the events on your uh, bulletins. Uh, we have a few uh, events coming up. And uh, ask me about uh, any of the volunteer events coming up. Uh, we have a secular week of action. Uh, you can continue your conversations uh, through the coffee break. And we'll be back in about 10 minutes. Thank you.
All right, everyone, uh, please start coming back to your seats. Uh, we'll start in about two minutes at, well, 11.15, so maybe a minute. Hello everybody, my name is Perla. I am a part of the Oasis community, been here for about a year. I'm gonna share a little, a little mini community moment, five minutes. Um, thank you, Sam, by the way, she's a really good friend and I'm really excited she's here and I hope that you enjoyed her, her talk. Um, I'm gonna share my testimony, my little journey to self-love. Um, I grew up with a lot of self-hatred, a lot of self-loathing my whole life. Um, struggled with severe social anxiety disorder as a child. Um, I know people <laughs> probably here will be like, what? Um, but it was a thing. I, it, I've come a very long way, but that's where I started. And um, I had body dysmorphia. I, I, it was really bad. <laughs> and so my whole life you know I it got a little better as the older that I got but it was still always there it was still always in the background and it really caused a lot of um, suffering <laughs> and pain and attracted a lot of abuse because when you're when you really don't have any self-worth any self-love that's what you attract and people sense it and they take advantage and etc so um, after a lifetime of misery and suffering <laughs> and severe extreme extreme depression and anxiety and all the things, um, I finally got to a point where I was like, I cannot live like this anymore. Literally, it has, something has to give because I, I'm, I'm not going to make it. Um, and... <sighs> Something to know about me is that I grew up in Christianity um, from, a, from birth, and um, I grew up with this religion forming my brain, my nervous system. Um, everything was formed by this belief system. I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with Christianity, but the actual scripture verses that I was made to memorize as a very young child. Um, Jeremiah 17, 9. Um, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? <laughs> so, bring in flashbacks. Um, Isaiah 64, 6. But we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousness is as filthy rags. And our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. John 3.30, God must increase, but I must decrease. So if you can imagine, <laughs> as a very young child, you take what you are told as absolute truth. That's what young brains are designed to do. <laughs> We're designed. Thoughts went deep and they formed nervous system, my brain, my um, psych psyche. So obviously, <laughs> of course, I was going to have tons of self-loathing, tons of self-hatred, no self-worth. Um, I didn't realize this, however, until um, <laughs> the same thing. I started to realize it when I was a part of the anti-trafficking organization that Sam was also a part of. And I started to learn about how traffickers uh, 
brainwash and mind control their victims. <laughs> and I was like, holy crap, like that's literally what I feel like was done to me um, in the religious sense of within Christianity. And so the more that I um, learned about uh, mental, emotional health trauma, the more I realized that it was um, how incredibly toxic the system was, and that's what ultimately led me out of Christianity. That was five, six years, five years ago. So I have advanced leaps and bounds, uh, hopefully, as you can tell. <laughs> um, and I just want to say, like, so many of you may not have the same, you know, story, but for many different reasons, you guys, a lot of us struggle with the same clothing. I just want to say there is hope, there is a way out, and I would just encourage you guys to not give up on yourselves because that's the whole point. We are all worthy of putting the effort and the work into um, giving ourselves the lives that we deserve. And... Um, part of that for me real quick um, from my journey was once I was out and once I knew like, okay, this, this is toxic. The, the thing that helped me a lot is um, finding a, a baby pictures of me, like pictures of me as a little girl and seeing that little girl as a complete stranger. And what, what evoked, what feelings that evoked and and what I would want for that little girl and what how I would treat that little girl and it just helped me a ton so um that's a little exercise that may you know help some of you but anyway that's my journey and thank you for listening <laughs> and now music Sorry about that. All right. Today's been a lot of fun to listen to everybody because it's like, you know, part of the reason you get into playing music as a kid is that usually due to being socially awkward. You're like, you're at a party and you don't know what to do. So you're like, well, man, maybe if I join a band, I can be here but not have to interact with anybody. <laughs> Actually, if you learn how to play, you get forced to interact, and it's that immersion therapy, so it helps. <laughs> All right, we're going to do this one. This is a, I wrote this song for a friend of mine who left her job, and when I, I say that every time. She did not leave her job. Her job gave up the office and went completely online, so she could go anywhere in the world. She went and bought a fifth wheel and bought a truck and got a divorce and was like, I'm going to go anywhere I want in America. And, you know, she just took off, and she made it up to visit her dad in northeast Texas, met someone, and they got married a few months later, and she sold all the stuff. <laughs> but the lesson is, it inspired me to write this song, so the, the lesson I always try to impart is always talk about the things you're probably going to try to do, and maybe you'll inspire someone else to do something even if you don't. So.
All right. Thank you. Uh, let's do uh, one last song uh, after uh, okay. Q&A, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, don't worry about the schedule here. Um, so before I uh, call Sam back up for a Q&A, uh, I want to make some announcements. Uh, uh, if you see your bulletins here, um, this is for benefit of uh, those streaming as well. Uh, we have a regular uh, cards group uh, that meets on Saturdays. Uh, uh, please contact Richard Andrews at uh, richard at houstonoasis.org uh, for getting on the uh, group invites. Uh, we also have uh, uh, bicycle rides uh, going. Uh, uh, I guess this is on Saturdays as well. Uh, you can email uh, Ted here or contact him. Uh, he's, uh, he should be in the back here. Uh, I don't see him. But uh, this, uh, they, they go from, uh, I guess it's uh, Baldwin Park uh, in Elgin Street. Um, uh, also, um, I, I do want to announce, uh, make it a point here to announce that uh, we have, uh, we're uh, going to be celebrating the Secular Week of Action in the uh, last week of April, first week of May. Uh, this uh, is essentially to, uh, uh, as a, uh, you could call it a competition or whatever, to the National Day of Prayer and uh, all the things that the religious groups do uh, during this time. Uh, so we're, we're going to be uh, showing uh, some of our core values in action by going to uh, several uh, volunteer events uh, during that week. Uh, we have uh, on uh, April 27th, we're going to where we'll be uh, removing invasives. Um, if you don't remember, uh, a few years ago, um, uh, through uh, uh, for several years actually, we've been uh, tree planting at Exploration Green, which is a redeveloped golf course in the Clear Lake uh, NASA area. And uh, we've had uh, great experiences there uh, in um, uh, getting that uh, 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 really beautiful park uh, off the ground. And if you haven't been there, just even for volunteering, please go check it out for sure. It's a, quite the treat uh, to see how flood control and uh, wildlife can come together for effective. Um, we also have uh, on May 4th, we're actually doing two events the same day going to be doing a homeless distribution and, uh, uh, in downtown, and in the afternoon we're going to go to the food bank. For the uh, uh, distribution uh, part, we're going to be announcing on email, uh, I'll send out an email uh, via the newsletter. If you don't have, if you're not subscribed to it, uh, please go to houstonoasis.org and uh, you have a, there's a link there to subscribe to the newsletter. And uh, I'll send out um, uh, what can be donated during the coming uh, weekends. You can, we'll have a box in the back, and you can donate the required toiletries and other items. Um, uh, we just want to make sure that if we have uh, a lot of the same kind of things so that we have enough to give out. So uh, just wait for that, and uh, uh, you can bring it over next week, and we'll collect them, and uh, we'll distribute them. And of course, uh, you can, you're uh, welcome to come in and help as well. Uh, all right. Let me bring Sam back up, and I'll I'll keep talking about it later. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh wow! Yes, please let me know if you have any questions. Sorry about that. Yes. I think Carla's going to bring a microphone. There, there we go. I appreciate your talk, Sam. It was powerful. Uh, what's your opinion on this? Um, this use of the word wellness and you know a lot of companies are using in a business around um, this term and uh, I see it possibly being <laughs> a money maker and I would, I'd like your opinion on that yeah I think um, um, there is a absolute commodification of all the things we are missing and wellness is so marketable now on everything. And it's funny because it's, when you think of wellness, you think of this inclusive, hospitable, be well, but it's actually very exclusive. The wellness industry is like, think of a hotel and a spa. It's supposed to be like calm and peaceful, and, and, but it's the most exclusive, unhospitable place because nobody can get there unless you, you can afford those things. So I think people are always trying to sell us wellness, 
But one thing that I love to focus on is the social dynamics of wellness. Like wellness is not only what you eat and do and what goes in your body and how you, but also what you have, what support systems you have around you. And so I think you have to look out for wellness and mindfulness attached to anything that anyone could sell. Like at the end of this talk, I would say, and if you want to learn to love yourself, you can buy my course for $500. And at the end of it, you can do a gold level love yourself member. And then you'll go to my deeper mentorship that's $7,000 a month. You know what I mean? I, so I agree. By the way, we um, really wanted to give an extended Q&A time, so we have until 12. We want to give as many uh, people the chance to talk, to qu ask questions. Um, what is your, pers from your perspective, your solution to combating the misinformation, particularly toxic misinformation uh, that gets boosted by like TikTok's algorithm in, when you put in like fitness or wellness? I think that the solution, I don't know if I have a solution for the problem, but a solution for me to live is that the things that make me feel good, for me, and it's not, I don't suggest for everybody, is I make sure my platform is so loud and that my voice is just as loud. So when you look up for the things that like, I, and I think I encourage others to do the same, people who have a, and that's one of the reasons, so I do marketing and social media like management, I teach people how to go viral or how to do Instagram or whatever, and I'm kind of good at it, so you know, <laughs> slay. Um, and I have a, so like on TikTok, I have 80,000 followers, and I have put videos of myself in what I would have considered unflattering clothing, which, which by the way, like when I used to be in my eating, I would have never posted a picture at this angle of a full body photo with my double chin showing, but only done this way and that way. That's why I put that picture there. That is a photo I would have been horrified to, f to see the light of day. Now I do not care about how my body appears. So I think the solution is to be mindful to whenever you make your decisions and you see something that makes you challenge your own decision for your wellness, you say, I, I look away. It's not healthy for me. And then if you are brave enough to have an alternative body or, or you, you're just different, or you, you, to be loud and be yourself and, and take up space. And when I'm on a plane, I say, hi, I'm a customer of size and I on Southwest and I'd like my extra free seat. And they're like, oh, I don't know if you're big enough for that. I'm like, oh my God, don't, don't stop. No, really, no, I do not fit. Um, and then I get an extender for the seat and I say it loud and then someone next to me goes, they have extenders? So I think that's part of the help is just like advocating for what you need as, as much as you can, because it is scary sometimes. But that's a great question. We actually don't have until 12, we have 10 till 12, so just quick. Uh, just from what you've said, I'm curious, are you a, a cradle Christian like Perla, or did you kind of get into it somehow? Thank you for asking, I'm absolutely not. I was raised, I was raised secular, and but poor, so they got me young. You know, I, mean? I went to one of those camps, they said, hey, camp for kids, you don't have to pay. <laughs> don't worry, you know, and they're like, but bring a Bible, and I thought, oh my goodness, and right around then, I had just been like, you know, I was 14, I had was, I was not a Christian kid, so then I go in this place, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't know I was, I, I didn't know that I was a fallen woman, <laughs> I didn't know all this stuff, and it hit me, but I jumped in, I'm also a nerd person, so I'm a musician, when I heard the music, we make a joke, this is my boyfriend, by the way, I didn't mention him earlier, but when, if he sings any song, I just start singing along. So if he's like, I hate that place, and I'm like, I hate that place. I'm like, no, I don't, wait, don't sing that song. I don't want to sing the song. And, and so I think that like, that pulled me into it, and I, it became the family I didn't have, the, fa the support system I didn't have, and they gave me answers for all the pain that I experienced. And I was in the church, still 15, and I went to Houston Baptist University, and I studied biblical studies and mass comm, um, and then did full-time ministry with Elijah Rising, our, uh, the anti-trafficking organization we talked and uh, yeah, so when I left, it felt like a return to kind of myself. And honestly, when I was in um, high, in, like, what do they call it now? High demand religion. Um, the, oh, what was that one? How was it like? High controlled, sorry, yes, yes. High controlled religion. They made me think that my parents were horrible people. Um, I was like, wow, my mom is really a woman who really didn't raise me right. My mom was a struggling single mother working multiple jobs trying to figure it out with no support systems. And, they, and I would tell her to like, go to God, and I was so stressed about her. In reality, she was like, girl, don't get pregnant. I was like, she was just trying to help me and be, she give me skills that actually mattered. Like, don't be poor, don't be get pregnant, don't do this. And I was like, no, I'm gonna go be poor for Jesus and have so many babies. You know what I mean? <laughs> but anyway, that's kind of how I got into it. And um, yeah, I saw all the same threads 
uh, 2020 did a lot for Which, by the way, like, one thing that is, is a new and wonderful development is I'm finally at a place where I can celebrate faith of my friends. Like, my mom now is in church, um, and she's like, I'm so sad they turned you away from God. I was like, it's fine. You do whatever you want, Mom. I love you. Don't give them your money, please. I was like, I have a biblical degree. Call me, and I will tell them about the widow's might, and they'll meet it, okay? But I was like, go, do your thing, Ma. and I'm grateful for that. Um, hi. Uh, thank you for your topic. It's so relevant for me. Um, I don't know if this is a question, but just to hear your thoughts on it. Uh, what the other member said about like wellness being like commodified and um, being like a whole industry thing, and I think that's so true. That's and like as someone who is you know also in a vulnerable state in life, I'm like you know kind of open eyes to these things and what's out there, but. I guess, like, okay, I kind of lost my train of thought. Are you maybe thinking, like, how to protect yourself from those things or just respond, thinking through what exists now? Sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, um, I guess, like, it's kind of dis uh, discouraging. Even, like, you follow someone on Instagram or something, they get really great information, but then, like, once they amass, like, a certain number of followers, then it has to be membership. And then they all become like that, and then it's like really hard. Um, and also the, I remember uh, I, when I was pregnant, I was looking up pr uh, mom, new mom discussion forums and threads and stuff, and sharing wellness advice, tips, wisdom, and all that stuff. And they were like kind of like mentioning a lot of like indigenous related wisdom and home remedies and stuff and and I like said something in there of, like you know the don't forget the other side of the experience of what indigenous women are experiencing and that like are we we're benefiting from their wisdom like uh, collectively we're kind of turning ourselves to like indigenous solutions for a lot of things like the water crisis they're they're asking like the tribals what should we do now we're desperate um it was met with, at best, like just nothing. <laughs> um, and so like, I wonder, uh, do you talk about that? Of like, a lot of these things are like within us or have been in our cultures and stuff and then like, you know, capitalism, <laughs> colonialism, all that yes. isms yes. down the way. Well, first, I want to tell you that, like, one thing that I hold is that every single person I admire, including myself, can has a pro has a propensity to be problematic, and we are all people trying to survive in a difficult situation, and I have to know that there can be a day where I make the wrong choice and I really disappoint people that look up to me, and what helps me in that is that when people let me down, it feels like, oh, that's a disappointment. Sandra, I really like Sandra, but, she, but you know, and then thinking, you know, maybe there was something that they had to do. And so when I go into spaces like that, I'm really on guard of like, I place or, but it's like finding community and finding well, it's unfortunate that it is so difficult to find people that understand. And the one thing I would say is those people show you their true colors and they, sh and they show you their lack of compassion. And, and it is brutal out there. And I wanna tell you that there are people who will find you, there are people that exist mostly in, and that because of the internet that will see things I think the way you do. And it's hard to find, but I believe that community exists out there. And if anything, I can't promise you that you'll find a group like that, but I can say you probably deserve it. You deserve to feel supported. And so maybe that's just enough of a reason to say, like, you deserve support, so maybe there's a, a, enough energy to look again um, and maybe be a part of a community of wellness that, that looks like it to you, because that means something different to all of us. And um, I am very... I feel very social, I would say culturally competent because of my past work. And I am shocked <laughs> at the lack of cultural, and when I say cultural competency, that means like the history of racism, the history of what's happened to indigenous people, ableism, sexism, gender inequality, like those experiences, how we should react to them. 
feels like a part of my everyday life because I've existed in it and walked alongside it and seen it and read about it and these things, but there's really people who still haven't battled with that and that is really disheartening and takes some grief and, it, and, and that sounds like you're in a place of grieving and that's, I think part of the process when you find yourself up against communities that don't validate who you are is it's grieving and it's hard and it's, and it's okay to be really sad about it. <laughs> And I think in that outcry, you might find someone with the same. Does anybody else have a question? Oh. Um, how would you apply <coughs> what, what you've learned to like be, I don't know if it's to be diplomatic or to traverse like this intense uh, political divide that we have. It's like us against them. We're mm -hmm. right and they're bad, 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 terrible. Well, that, that's a great question. And I always try to redirect it to the common ground that it's really us against them. You know what I mean? Like systems of, you know, and I, I don't know. I always try to make it very clear when I'm speaking to someone who maybe doesn't look like me, who sits on the other side of Bass Pro Shop or whatever. <laughs> Um, <laughs> that might be, <laughs> thank you, someone's awake today. <laughs> but I like to say things such as my displeasure with my own political leaders, to say that my trust lies within these values, not within those people, because I find that the attacks come at very petty things or this or even that. And also too, I was a human trafficking expert. They always like to go back to that. And I was like, literally, I under, you know, when they get into the conspiracies of this. And so my general distrust of the government in the way of like, I'll, I'll go to the doctor, but like, I just know that they're not sitting like, how can we make Sam's life better? You know what I mean? Um, I think helps me cross that line. When in the, and, and also too, I just, try, I just try to have grace to understand like you're afraid of something. If you're this passionate and you're screaming about this political issue, you're very afraid of something. And I'm sorry. So, um, and I won't engage with it, honestly, if it becomes toxic. Like, I can't, I'm no longer taking feedback on this issue. Might be the way to <laughs> diplomatically handle that. Handle that. Um, I was wondering if you could share some strategies um, that we can implement to increase our self esteem and confidence. Yes, which depending on everyone's mental health, you know, talk to your therapist. Some things that may work for me, if depending on your background could be hard or difficult for you, but just some ideas that you could try. Um, for me was journaling the uh, things I accomplished every day. Um, I would always leave the thing, thing, I didn't fix the issue of not being a millionaire and paying off all my bills today. Um, thus, and I'm a lot farther than <laughs> that anyway, but. But I would write down, I woke up my kid today. I literally check off a box on a checklist. I can show it to you in my binder that says like hard things I did today, beauty I noticed today. And what it did is I, I'm always reframing what doesn't fit, right? What's broken, what's a mess, the laundry that's on the floor, but I don't take space to go, I really took time to have that hard conversation with my partner in a really gracious way. And we really, really cared for each other. So writing that down helped me reformat myself to remember writing down things that you like about yourself. And when I started that like that journaling process, the first time it was like, I like that I can sing, but I only do that because I'm so desperate for attention. Like that's what would be in my head. But now it's like, oh my God, I have the most beautiful gray hair. I am so funny. Like, so funny. That's why I'm struggling with dating, because they can't handle how funny I am. You know what I mean? That's the way it changed. And it became a way where it doesn't make other people feel small. And that's what I think. So practicing looking mirror work could be if you're able, you know. And um, anything, also, too, just having people around you and thinking, how do they make me feel about myself? And just examining, do I need to make changes in my life? But it does show a one on the clock, so I don't, I'm, I'm looking because I'm a rule follower in some ways, and I want to make sure. I think we're done with the questions, I think. Yeah. Thank Real you. quick. There's my contact. Is Sam? Um, yeah. That you guys can fill out. You can put your name if you want. But we really, really value your feedback on today's program. So we're trying to change some things around and see what uh, you guys respond to and to improve your experience every Sunday. So it's important to us. Thank you. Thanks, Berla and Sam. That was great work uh, together. And 
Our uh, speakers team certainly has been uh, looking at a lot of ideas, so definitely please answer that survey um, if you can. And uh, also, um, uh, we have uh, we have a few more items uh, I just want to mention. Uh, uh, one is, uh, of course, uh, our volunteers here. Uh, they they've, do bit, they've been doing everything since uh, uh, two hours ago, basically at this point. Uh, they've been here since 9 a.m. Uh, getting stuff out, out and uh, please uh, help us uh, if you can. And uh, uh, we have uh, Kevin in the back, and uh, we have uh, uh, we have Charles here on the on the soundboard uh, running. Plus, we have uh, people in coffee, and we have several people helping as well in the audience. Uh, if you can help uh, afterwards, uh, put the chairs away and all that, uh, that'll be really helpful to get us out out of here. Uh, also, this uh, we have. Um, uh, so today is uh, bring your own lunch day. Uh, we are we do have pizza, but uh, if you would like to order your own lunch in, uh, you can do that as well. We, we're gonna set up uh, uh, tables uh, after this, and uh, we'll have uh, 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 we can have some food uh, so that we can stay in the room for a while and continue our conversations. Um, okay, so I guess uh, at this point we can bring up uh, Bright Wire for our last song, and uh, let's get other going. Thank you. One of the things we were initially going to do is, you know, hawk the new record, but never mind. <laughs> After listening to everybody today, we did have a new record. It's fine. It's over there. That's beside the point. Um, after hearing the talk today, years ago, we wrote a song, and uh, this was not on the thing, so we'll see how it goes. But uh, it's kind of the point. The good thing is about talks like Sam and Perla's and stuff like that is, A, me personally, I believe that it's good to, older generation likes to try to hide everything. You know, your parents didn't want to talk about the issues they had. And it's good that people now are starting to be honest about how, sorry for the language, but how fucked up we all kind of are. And it's, it's normal, everyone is. If you go through this whole life and you go through and you slide in clean and mentally healthy, you know, what'd you really do, you know? <laughs> So that's all we always tell you know, go out there, get some scars, tear some things up, draw all over yourself, do things that, you know, think because it's important, you know, you're going to live this life and do some crazy things. And sometimes it, it is hard, but the more we admit, the less you feel alone in admitting that, you know, we're all kind of broken in our own ways and you don't have to get along with everybody. You find your communities out in the world that are kind of fucked up like you are and y'all kind of fit together and that was kind of the idea of this song was we all have our cracked edges but occasionally we fit together like puzzle pieces and we create our communities like ones like this here today so <laughs> that's beautiful man <laughs> thanks uh so this song's called cracked edges it's about going out in the world and finding your community and you know realizing not everybody has to think like you do so it goes like
Thank you. Yeah. Right wire, everyone. Uh, before we break for lunch, I have a couple more items. Uh, first, uh, uh, Houston Oasis is a volunteer-run uh, uh, 501c3 organization. Uh, we, we pay for the room, we pay for our musicians and speakers uh, coming in. Uh, so uh, please, uh, whatever donations uh, you can uh, is, uh, is welcome. And if not, of course, uh, we're, you're, we're very glad you're here. Uh, we have a hat in the back for cash. Uh, we also have some uh, recurring donations, uh, things on there. Of course, there's modern ways of giving uh, on the website, and uh, we have a QR code as well on the back of your bulletins where you can scan and go to the website portal that uh, allows you to donate uh, with the credit card and others. And, and we, have, uh, we have a square and all that too, <laughs> so l let us know. Uh, all right, um, the other one is uh, we have uh, several exciting speakers coming up, uh, including uh, Tim here, uh, who's going to be speaking next week. Uh, he would like to sp uh, spend a couple of times to give a summary of the talk, I guess. I'd like to give everyone a special invitation to be here next week. The topic is wonder, awe, and gratitude for humanists. People are always telling us, you can't... You, you don't know the most awesome, wonderful thing in the universe. You don't know God. How can you experience awe and wonder? And gratitude, well, you don't even have anybody to be thankful to. Well, come next week, and you will learn just how wrong they are. <laughs> Be here at 1030. Be here at 1030 for a skit. We've got some drama talent here, and it's called... Humanist at the zoo. You've got to be here at 1030, though, or you'll miss it. And uh, uh, we have uh, over 30 volunteers from our community who will be participating in some way or another to make this happen, to make it interesting, interactive. Um, and if you want to come early, playing in the background will be about a 12-minute uh, video uh, showing you things like flowers, animals, sunsets that remind us, because part of this thing about wonder is appreciating beauty, so if you come early, you'll, you'll get a little extra. The survey cards, uh, if you need one, if you didn't get one, see me up front here afterwards. You can leave them in your seat or give them to me or to Perla as you leave. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. That sounds like a very exciting Sunday. Another one. Uh, Richard, you had something? Yes, uh, yes. as I mentioned, we, uh, we'll be bringing in pizza, and uh, there is food here, but if you'd like to order your own choice of food, please uh, feel free to do that. And uh, with that, I think, uh, thank you everyone for coming, and uh, we're gonna go, go to lunch at this point, and uh, lunch is right here in this room, so thank you.